and welcome to Serena Speaks. And I put out a message on Facebook asking what um, particular topics you would like me to go over or cover in more depth. And one that kept cropping up was the cardiovascular section and in particular the different types of heart attacks and more um, information on beta blockers. So um, let's start off with heart attacks. So there's two main types. One is called STEMI and one is called NSTEMI. Now, before we go any further, it's really important that we understand um, an ECG, so an electrocardiogram of the heart of a patient experiencing a heart attack. So first of all, what does a normal ECG look like? Well, using my amazing artistic skills, I've drawn one. And so as we can see, the ECG is made up of three main parts, P, this QRS complex, and T. But what does each bit mean? Well, our P, so this section, refers to the, um, atrial depolarization, so i.e. when the atria are contracting. Our QRS, that refers to ventricular depolarization, so our, our ventricles are contracting. And our T refers to ventricular repolarization, so when our ventricles are chilling out and relaxing. So now, if we look at the term NSTEMI, what does that actually mean? It stands for non-ST elevated myocardial infarction, whereas STEMI stands for ST elevated myocardial infarction. So it's referring to this section over here, our ST. So in the case of a STEMI, it is what it says, the ST bit is elevated. So if you see an ECG of someone undergoing a STEMI heart attack, this particular bit will be all squiggled up, up here. Whereas with an NSTEMI, it's non-ST. So the ST isn't elevated. So actually this area is gonna be down here squiggly fired and down here somewhere. So why does that matter? Well. In the case of a heart attack, when a person is experiencing a heart attack, the signs and symptoms of both a STEMI and NSTEMI are going to look the same. A person might get a tight chest, which can radiate their jaw, their back. They might be feeling dizzy, feeling nauseous. And so through looking at signs and symptoms alone, we're not going to be able to establish whether a person is experiencing an NSTEMI or a STEMI heart attack. Therefore, we need to hook them up onto the ECG and see which one they're experiencing. And as mentioned, if it's a STEMI, the ST part is going to be elevated up here, whereas with an N STEMI, the ST part is going to be down here somewhere. So it is what it says. And in most cases of a heart attack, it ends up being that a person is undergoing a STEMI. And STEMIs tend to be, or well, they are, more severe than the N STEMIs. And that's because in an NSTEMI, it's usually a partial blockage of a major artery, usually due to atherosclerosis. Whereas in the case of a STEMI, it's usually due to full blockage, again, down to atherosclerosis. So the blood's not being able to flow about the way that it should. Now, the treatment options in both cases are going to be very similar. So if we start off with NSTEMI, first and foremost, we need to give the person enough oxygen. Um, we might also give them nitrates for ischemic pain, but I'll come on to that in a bit more detail in a bit. And we're going to need to give them aspirin, either chewable or dispersible. If the person is experiencing a heart attack, say at home, and they've taken aspirin, then it's really important that when they go into hospital, there's a note with them saying that they've already taken aspirin, because then we don't want them to have like another dose of aspirin. We might also give them clopidogrel or ticagrelor, so a form of antiplatelet, as well as a heparin, such as low molecular weight heparin or um, fondoparinux. And we'd also give them um, a beta blocker. And again, I'll talk about beta blockers in a bit more detail later on. If a beta blocker is contraindicated in the patient, though, then we can give them diltiazem or verapamil instead. So in a STEMI, again, we would give all of those things. But what we might also give, especially for long term treatment, would be a high dose of an ACE inhibitor or if a patient can't take that, then an angiotensin 2 receptor antagonist, our ARB, as well as a high dose of statins. And these are used for um, prophylaxis. So even if the patient doesn't necessarily have a high, high cholesterol, we would still give them the statins for long term therapy. 
So when a patient is discharged from hospital, we would give them what I call the famous five medication. So we'd give them aspirin, we would give them an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, statin, their beta blocker, and an antiplatelet, so clopidogrel or ticagrelor. And that only usually needs to be given for a year um, because the benefits of it are seen for that year. And then after that, it's not really necessary for them to continue taking it. And that's why something like MURs are so important, so that if you do have a patient that has um, recently been discharged from hospital because they've had a heart attack, or if you notice that a patient is on these five medication, make sure that they are only taking, or at least that they're aware that they should only be taking that antiplatelet for one year, um, not any longer than that, unless, of course, their doctor wants to keep them on it for whatever reason. Um, and I've also mentioned nitrates earlier. So nitrates can be used for ischemic pain. And when a patient um, has a heart attack, sometimes, even if they don't have angina, the doctor will also prescribe them a GTN sublingual spray for prophylaxis. So if they do experience any of that high chestedness or anything again, at least they have that GTN to hand. We can kind of think of the GTN spray as like an EpiPen. So it's there when, when if we ever do need to use it. And it's important again to make sure with your patients that firstly they know how to use it and secondly that it's still in date because it's something that won't need to be routinely prescribed with the other medication they might forget they might put it on their shelf and then forget that it's there um, and then if there ever does come a time when they do need to use it it could potentially be out of date and that's a note worth mentioning with the EpiPens as well so it's really important that the patient keeps note of what the expiry date are on these particular medication. So now some patients may need to undergo something called a PCI, a percutaneous coronary intervention. And what this basically means is try, we know that the, um, there's a blockage in the arteries and what a PCI tries to do is basically open up the arteries, get rid of that blockage and get that blood flowing. And usually it's in STEMI when we would use a PCI. Now, it's a non-surgical procedure, but it requires a catheter to be um, inserted, usually either via the wrist or the groin, and it's all the way up into the heart. And it could be attached with a balloon. Well, it's used, it is attached with a balloon, with or without a stent. So the catheter with the balloon goes into the artery. The balloon is inflated. And what it does is that, that blockage that's all there, that's then separated and the plaque rests on the side of the walls and now we have this nice gap to allow the blood to flow again and with some patients they may need a stent so that balloon is inflated and a stent is kept in place to keep this open the balloon is removed the catheter is removed but the stent is still kept in place to keep those walls open now with patients that have had a heart attack it's really important that they understand that just because their heart now has this stent in place doesn't necessarily mean that they're fixed. They still do need to take the medication, of course, but they do need to take major lifestyle and lifestyle changes in terms of their diet and exercise. So some hospital programmes will have a rehabilitation process in place to help um, patients with with exercises which don't won't strain the heart too much because we still need to be careful. They need to do exercise, but not ones that are really going to, you know, mess around with the heart but enough that they can um, they can help with losing weight for example so I think usually what they say is a third of it is a medic is medication a third of it is diet and a third of it is exercise and it's so important that a patient does all of those things in order to live a long life really and all patients um, who have had a heart attack should be closely monitored for hyperglycemia and if they are diabetic then they may need to receive insulin. So now patients that have had a heart attack they may also have something called left ventricular dysfunction and this can come about in one of two ways. One of which is when the ventricles aren't contracting properly so enough blood isn't sufficiently being um, sent to the rest of the body or the ventricles aren't relaxing properly in which case Blood can't fill up um, properly in the heart um, between the resting stages of each beat. Now, a patient that has left ventricular dysfunction and we need to give them a beta blocker, there's only certain ones that we can give. For example, covidolol and bisoprolol. Whereas if a patient doesn't have left ventricular dysfunction, we can give them asbutalol and metoprolol. If a patient um, 
can't take beta blockers because they're contraindicated, then we might give diltiazem, which is unlicensed, or verapamil. But in patients that have left ventricular dysfunction, we can't give them diltiazem or verapamil. That is contraindicated. So it's only when they don't have left ventricular dysfunction and beta blockers are contraindicated, then only we would resort to diltiazem or verapamil. So continuing with beta blockers, so I've had somebody ask, why is it that we use cardioselective beta blockers in patients who are, for example, asthmatic, rather than cardiospecific ones? Well, in order to understand that, we need to understand the two main types of beta blockers, beta 1 and beta 2. Beta 1 are mostly found in the heart. Beta 2 can be found on the bronchioles, on muscles, i.e. in other places that aren't the heart. So now, in patients that have asthma, well-controlled asthma, or have COPD, but they, we really need to give them a beta blocker, we want to give ones that act on the heart, because we don't want to give the ones that act on the bronchial, because that's where they've got the asthma and the COPD. So we, we don't want to complicate things further by giving them something that's going to act on that particular area. So we're going to give beta blockers that just act on beta 1. So for example, our atenolol, bisoprolol, metoprolol, and these are our cardio-selective beta blockers. So in patients that are asthmatic or have COPD, we give cardio-selective beta blockers, i.e. the ones that just act on those beta 1, on those ones on the heart, and not on those ones that act in the rest of us, so on the bronchial muscles, etc. Now, I understand that this topic is a very content heavy topic and when doing it, it can be very overwhelming. What I suggest is, yes, definitely go through the content, understand it as much as you can, but when you get a chance, try and do questions because the questions will make you realise what kind of things it is that the exam is asking of you. They want you to be able to apply your knowledge. So, for example, they might give you a case study where a patient is on, for example, making this up, they're on simvastatin, they're on benzoflumathiazide, and they're on amlodipine. And patient goes to the doctor, doctor gives them clarithromycin, and the question might ask, which of the medications need to be stopped because this clarithromycin is being given? And the answer would be the statin, because statin plus clarithromycin increases the risk of myopathy. So you can see in that case scenario, they're not actually asking you for word by word def well word by word um content that you might have just read in the bnf and then you're memorizing that information and regurgitating it in the exam they're not asking of that they're actually asking you to apply your knowledge that okay i know simvastatin can cause muscle aches and to be able to know that with clarithromycin it causes even more risk of myopathy so during that time when the person is taking clarithromycin they need to stop taking their simvastatin the other quiet types of questions that they might ask with this particular chapter are specific side effects. So, for example, that you know that something like Ramapril will cause a dry cough or benzoflumathiazide shouldn't be used in gout. They might also ask questions to do with um, contraindications. So, for example, that you know that something like losartan and benzoflumathiazide can cause increased hypotensive effect or that simvastatin 40 milligrams should not be given with amlodipine regardless of the strength, amlodipine 5, amlodipine 10, simvastatin 40 should not be given, it should be less than that. They might ask you um, high risk questions on high risk medications. So for example, benzoflumathiazide, spironolactone, they precipitate lithium toxicity, or they might want you to know what you need to monitor, for example, in patients taking amiodarone or digoxin, or patients that have, are on statins, so not high risk medicine, but what do we need to monitor patients that are on statins? So for example, if they're experiencing muscle pain, we might want to measure their creatinine kinase level. Whereas if they uh, just generally, patients that are on statins, their ALT should be um, monitored. So it is so important to go over the content, but it's even more important to understand the concepts of the content and know these key interactions. And as I mentioned, go over questions that, I mean, yes, go over the content, but go over the questions as well so that you get a feel and an idea of what it is that the exam is looking for. I've also been um, asked what OTC books or resources I recommend. My number one that I recommend is the SPCs, the PIL. So if you go onto Google and you type in EMC, 
you get this wonderful website and you literally type in any medication and it will show you the SPC for that medication and the PIL. Those are your greatest resources as well as the RPS website. Under RPS, go on to OTC medication and there's a full list of resources that you can use there. And those ones I definitely, definitely, definitely recommend. So I hope you found this video useful. Um, I hope it's cleared up a few of the concepts that maybe you didn't understand beforehand. Um, and hopefully you liked it. And if you did, why not give us a thumbs up, share, subscribe, tell all your friends about it and good luck with your revision and happy revisings.